My name is Rebecca Bloomhagen, and uh, this is my third year as part of Salutra Shorts. I was there with two films uh, last year, The New Homesmiths, I Live in a Tiny House, and the year before, The Happiness Machine. And I was very excited to get the chance to ask you some questions for this virtual Q&A. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind introducing yourself, that would be great. Sure, my name is my name is Gita Gunbear, and I am a Brooklyn-based filmmaker. Awesome, cool, great. So I saw the film, loved it, um, and yeah, I'm curious um, where the seed for the idea of this started. Sure. So I think um, so. I come from an immigrant uh, background. My parents migrated to the U.S. in the 1960s and I think my whole life I've always been interested in um, in sort of questions of displacement, home, you know, what, what does home mean, and migration. And uh, when we think about migration there is obviously voluntary migration and then there is forced migration. And um, I think that in recent years, obviously, we've seen an uptick in the powers of ICE in this country. We've seen um, an uptick in deportations. In 2019, I think 267,000 people were deported um, by, you know, and were sort of taken by ICE and, and sent off to, you know, to various places around the world. And, um, you know, so, so for me, I always wanted to do a story about you know having to do with uh with migration with these themes of migration and displacement and and what what the meaning of home what does home mean and um and i read an article in the new york times about the this community of deportees in particularly in tijuana that was forming over the years and uh, the, the call centers that were springing up sort of opportunistically, right? Opportunistic capitalism to, um, to recruit them because they were English speaking. This is, these are again deportees who were uh, to deported from the US to the city of Tijuana in Mexico, which is a border city, our border city. And, um, and I found it fascinating that there was this sort of this untold story to me about folks who had been deported, the communities that had sprung up, and also how incredibly brave and resilient they were, despite what they had been through. Uh, the, the idea that um, most of these folks had never actually lived in the country that they were being deported to. Many of them were not Spanish speaking. They'd been, they only knew the U.S. their entire life, and yet they um, Manage, we're managing to A, survive, and then B, perhaps build families and lives, um, but all in the shadow of this kind of trauma of being, you know, the, being sort of rejected and ejected from the US. And, um, and the fact that capitalism is still this pervasive thing that even in people's worst hour, right, in their, um, you know, was present to try to, and in some ways, even though the call centers are not. Um, are, are looked at as, and they are sort of exploitative places. Uh, the idea that that uh, folks in this community were reliant on them was was really interesting to me. So it's a complicated short story that um, I ended up making, but uh, but that's the origin of the idea. It has that nice thread of relatability too, because all of us have called a call center <laughs> at one point in time, but it's usually not an environment where you're feeling a personal connection to the person. You're like trying to solve a problem and in a rush. And so it was really cool to get kind of an inside look at like the personal lives behind these people that we have talked to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we think about it. I don't think we think about it. I don't mean to think about who is answering. Yeah. the call on the other side of the line. And the fact that the person who is answering your call could be a deported, you know, a person who spent their entire life in the U.S. and is now deported. And you are the connection they have to the U.S. I mean, obviously, many times it's their family, but they spend all day often talking to people who are ensconced in the U.S. and have zero um, sort of awareness or consciousness of, you know, this larger 
uh, this larger, the sort of the larger landscape, mm -hmm. right? That is allowing them to make to, to connect to somebody across the border, mm -hmm. um, and all the forces at work that go into this one simple call. That was really interesting to me. So what took you from reading that article to deciding this is my film? Sure. So um, it was a, so, so my partner, there's a couple of partners in this uh, topic, uh, which is part of First Look. Uh, they're a studio here in New York, and I was really interested in, you know, I've been talking to them for a while about ideas for a short. And, um, and so, you know, I mentioned this one and they thought it was a great story. And then I uh, brought on board Multitude Films and they're, they're a production company here in New York. Uh, Jessica Devaney is an amazing producing partner. And so, you know, she came on board and then also we built a, a team we in uh, Tijuana, it was really, really important to us to have um, a local team that was representative of the community in Tijuana and who had equal say in what we were doing because none of us are from Tijuana. None of us, uh, at least myself and Jessica, are not um, of Mexican descent. So it was it was critical to us to have folks on the ground. We had an amazing producer, Abraham Avila, who was who could hold us accountable and bring authenticity and integrity um, to the film and uh, and represent, you know, also, you know, again, create the checks and balances needed because when you go into a community as an outsider, you want to make sure that you are, again, properly elevating the voices that you're representing and not, you know, again, a, taking on a do no harm policy. And, um, and so it was really, that was really instrumental, our team that was on the ground as well. Um, and uh, we spent an equivalent of about two weeks there to, to make the film over a period of time, you know, did one shoot, then another shoot, and, uh, and got to spend time with these, these folks, which was amazing. And then did you have other shooting happening when you personally were not there? Or was it pretty much confined to the two weeks? So, so, so there was, uh, I think, Abram and his team did, there was one shoot that our character, uh, our participant, I should say, uh, Roberto could not make. So, so when we were not there, that was a pickup shoot that Abram did with his team. Okay. Do you have an example where having a producer on your team that sort of came from the perspective of the community that you were working with proved valuable in a way that you didn't expect? Absolutely. No, it's always valuable. I think, again, the, the comfort, the trust is critical. Um, having someone who lives in the city, you know, again, who lives in the city, who experiences what the folks who live there experience every day. Again, Abraham was, is not, he's a Tijuana local. So his experience is not quite exactly the same as the folks who have been deported who were in the U.S. their whole lives. But it is, you know, again, you, he is, again, he is Mexican. He understands um, more of what they've been through. He had worked in a call center. What was interesting is, and that was something that was really important. I think almost everybody in our team, including my, my amazing DP, Asad Baruki, who is like a, also a partner, we've directed films together. He, um, he is Pakistani, but he had worked in a call center in Pakistan. So everyone, you know, on that team that was on the ground, but for me, had worked in a call center. So that was also really critical. So they understood the dynamics and understood sort of what it was like to have to do this work where you're speaking to like people across borders and from other countries. So there, it was, I mean, we couldn't have done it without uh, the team that we had on the ground. And I don't think we would have, honestly, like for me, I think ethically at this point, um, you know, in documentary storytelling, which is inherently a colonial exercise, you, you know, it's stem, a documentary stems from originally from folks from outside of a community, generally Europeans going into a community and filming their lives. And, you know, again, you have to, the gaze becomes the gaze of the person making the film. And if you want it to be as authentic as possible and as empowering as possible, I think for the, for the participants, you have to um, engage folks from the community. Otherwise, I think you're doing a disservice. Yeah. Do you have practical ways that of like moments where you asked 
for feedback on something or, you know, they said, oh, oh shooting okay. or any stories you could share for? Well, we, um, we shared the cut with uh with abram and the team on the ground obviously more than once we when we were doing the editing just to make sure that you know one language was correct uh two because we had to subtitle it because it was there was spanish in it um even though our participants spoke english there were times where obviously folks were speaking spanish um because it was in tijuana and the one of the call centers uh was a spanish-speaking call center which is um one of our participants owns a call center or had a call center so his was a spanish-speaking call center so the um so we we would show them cuts and just get their take you know and their feedback was as critical as anybody else's cool so do you have um in terms of your career as a documentary filmmaker the transition between what would you say was like the hardest uh, trend like step forward to make was it making your first film was it like from your first to your second and what advice might you have for up-and-coming filmmakers um when sure. so for me i think the hardest transition was that for many many years i was an editor mm -hmm. like i and that was an amazing career and i still love editing and i felt documentaries are made in the edit so much of the time like the editor is a co-director and i say that not just because i was an editor but because i think it's i think it's true you know the the edit room is where you really piece together the story and um, it's very different than scripted often because you don't have a script in documentary you know unless you're doing a piece that's narr completely narrated um, so so I think for me the hardest thing was really uh, the transition once I was I'd been editing for a long time I established myself as an editor which is you know I was very fortunate but I want I started to want to direct it was hard for people you know to they're like, what, what have you done? And you know, you're an editor. And so it was that transition was challenging for me. It was sort of like for people to allow me to grow I, and not even allow me, but to, to recognize that I had grown, you know, I think uh, I still, and I, I, it's great to be able to do both, you know, obviously, like I don't want to not ever be seen as an editor, but I, I think to get, to get funding and access, you know, sort of access to funding at, in my position was hard. It, um, there was an amazing group, Chicken and Egg, uh, the Chicken and Egg Pictures that were the first to actually fund any of my attempts as a director. Mm -hmm. And so I have to thank them because they were a group that really believes, you know, they, they fund films by women, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that was, it was super meaningful, you know, like I would not have made my first film without them like our it was it was actually my second film because i was making the first film and also just uh i had a producer a producing partner perry peltz who um we made a first film together and she put in the investment for it so i think those were some of the steps we had to take i think the idea of making a short film is a really great calling card for documentary filmmakers i think the mistakes we sometimes and i wish i had done that I did one, I, one of my first films was a short and it was helpful, but I think oftentimes we as filmmakers feel like our first film has to be some epic, you know, 90 minute documentary, which is already challenging for a doc to be 90 minutes. But the, you know, I think the reality is to get your foot in the door. Shorts are a great way to do it. Shorts are, are manageable. You can, win a lot of awards you can get a lot of recognition and they're a great stepping stone to a feature so i would suggest that it, particularly if you're interested in directing you know to do the shorts route to make something that again doesn't take forever you know takes takes uh costs less you know and but gets your you know your talent out there quicker is a good way to go um you know start and and feel know that your opus will come you know it can a short can still be your opus but the idea of like somehow people seem to think that the length of the film matters and it really doesn't yeah especially now it's like uh, studios like topic and they yeah a lot of the streaming yeah you know shorts are very popular and then there's quibi which is essentially you know for whatever however it's doing, you know, it's essentially dedicated to short form, you know, which is based on our, you know, our lives, like YouTube and, you know, TikTok, et cetera. So like you, when you think about it, that short form has a lot to offer. Yeah. Um, 
so do you have any sort of parting thoughts of like uh, things you wish people, uh, hope people get from the film or like a scene maybe that you cut out that you want to tell a story of here? Hmm. So I think, I feel like the, what I hope people walk away with from the film and, you know, which is, I think, the thing I can really speak to because, uh, you know, what we, what we cut out, I feel like there, there wasn't anything that we cut out that didn't feel like, you know, it's, there's some semblance of it in the film, you know, or that that point is made. What I really hope is that people take from the film is that, again, that if they think about migration um, and forced migration maybe a little differently. I think there's, you know, again, we're very, we're a country that is extremely polarized thanks to the leadership that we, or lack of leadership that we have um, around immigration. And ironically, this is a country where unless you are indigenous, everyone is, you know, an immigrant. Again, whether some people were trafficked here, obviously, like uh, African Americans who uh, were enslaved, whose ancestors were enslaved originally, and then some people who are refugees, obviously, and that, that is forced migration as well. But everyone else is a migrant. And the idea that um, our attitude, the general attitude towards migrants has become what it has, again, because of misinformation and disinformation from coming from the Oval Office is really alarming. And the idea that, you know, uh, migrants and immigrants are being blamed for, you know, are being scapegoated, I should say, is, um, is it's, it's just unacceptable. It's absolutely unacceptable. We are all, unless we all need to look in the mirror and recognize who we are. And I think the, um, again, the story of deportation, when we look at folks who I believe possibly deserved a second chance, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, is really, again, I think we have to rethinking our policies around, uh, around these issues is critical. And we have an election coming up. So I hope people can, can vote wisely <laughs> and with, you know, their, you know, with sort of all these things in mind. Like, what is the country we want to be? Do we want to be um, sort of a intolerant, punitive sort of place that um, where actually the acts, you know, the acts could fall next on anybody, including one of us, including, you know, you, like anyone out there? Or do we want to be a place that is, again, of, of, uh, of tolerance, of acceptance, of, you know, that, that sort of, is a, is a place that is again welcoming you know what the original vision of this country supposedly was right mm -hmm. um that actually takes that is welcoming of of everyone from around the world and uh and and gives people a chance at the american dream you know whatever that now may be <laughs> so it's um so those are those are i think my thoughts around the film and around the issues that it raises